Hi, today we're looking at the Pentax K100D Super. Let's see if it lives up to its name. The K100D Super is the replacement for the K100D, which we tested about a year ago. At the time we commented on the compactness of that camera, but here we are a year later, virtually the same body, and this camera is now the biggest and heaviest camera in its class because of the general trend for smaller cameras which competitors have launched in the meantime. But that's not to say that's a bad thing. Bigger cameras suit people with bigger hands. Smaller cameras, it's not everyone's cup of tea. So it's really a personal thing as to whether you like a bigger or a smaller camera. The camera has a 6 megapixel sensor, making it the lowest resolution digital SLR on the market, apart from the Nikon D40, which is probably getting near the end of its uh, life by now. That's not, again, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we're constantly saying that the number of megapixels is not what counts, it's what the camera does with the pixels that's important. And six megapixels is easily enough to make A4 prints, and certainly prints more than that, you'd really struggle to see that much difference in quality between a six megapixel and, say, an eight megapixel camera. People who are used to probably slightly higher end digital SLRs would expect possibly more buttons on the camera than, than this has. Uh, one of the things about this camera is it is kept fairly simple and kind of fairly minimalist. You can switch the anti-shake on or off. Obviously, if you're using the camera on a tripod or in, in very bright sun at high shutter speeds, you don't need it. The other notable thing about this sensor and what makes it different from the K100D is that it also has an anti-dust device which activates when you start the camera up. You may have heard that shuddering sound. That's the sensor shaking the dust off. You can, of course, switch that off if you don't want it on and it makes the camera start up quicker if you do leave it switched off. The camera has the usual range of exposure modes, program, shutter priority, aperture priority, manual and B. There's a flash off mode. There are several preset subject modes, night, sport, macro, infinity and portraits. And there's another eight scene modes in the menu. There's also a mode called auto pit. This is a strange one because it uh, automatically selects which scene mode to use for the given shooting situation. So if you like, it's an automatic mode which automatically selects which auto mode it should use. That's quite a lot of automation. Focusing is taken care of in this camera courtesy of the Safox 3 focusing module which uses 11 focus points spread across the frame. That's actually the highest in its class. The Nikon D40 and Olympus uh, 410 only have three focusing points. The Canon has nine. There are of course three metering modes. The multi-pattern metering which uses 16 zones, uh, spot and centre weighted. These have to be accessed via the menu. There is no button on the outside of the body to adjust the metering mode. Pentax has chosen to keep the number of external buttons to a minimum so that it doesn't look too confusing to the novice photographer. Consequently, more experienced photographers may wonder where some of the most important functions are hidden. Chances are they'll be behind this function button here. Pressing the function key brings up like a compass pad interface. Pressing the right hand control takes you to the ISO, where you can see here that it's 200 to 3200 is the range. Pressing the left you get the white balance control, auto white balance, plus all the presets and the manual. Going to the top, you've got the drive modes, the single, continuous, and the self-timer modes. Speaking of drive modes, this camera is capable of 2.8 frames per second, which is not bad, but only for about five JPEGs, which is not very good at all. In fact, it's probably the worst performance of any camera in this class. So I'd say if you're looking for a camera for action photography, you can stop watching now. Finally, if you head south on the compass pad, you get the flash control, auto manual, slow sync, and the usual selection. For most of the other controls you need, you have to delve into the menu. As you can see here, if you want to change something like the metering pattern, you've got to do press for the menu. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It would be nine. Nine button presses to get to that mode, and then you've got to press it again to select the one you want. Ten or eleven presses, which is you know not ideal really. You'll also find the auto bracketing control here and the, the focus point selection here and a few other things that would be really quite nice the, the uh, quality level and, and, and um, compression rate. It would be quite nice for some of these buttons to be on the camera but also but doing that would make the camera a more complex beast. So to some photographers it would be a real pain having to go into the menu for controls like this. For others, for novices, perhaps not such a big deal. Focusing points, maybe you'd set that once at the beginning of the shoot or maybe you just leave it on the same one all the time. Metering modes, how often do you really switch to spot metering mode? So, okay, we can criticise it, but it's not really the end of the world. So what about image quality? What are the pictures like? Let's have a look. 
Well, the good news is that the K100D Super delivers very good pictures indeed. In fact, this camera stands as proof, if anyone needed, that 6 megapixels is enough for most people. The images are clean and nicely saturated. Some may say too saturated, but you can of course turn that down in the setup menu. Even shooting high contrast subjects straight into the sun failed to produce any significant fringing around the edges, which is pretty good. And noise is extremely good, even at relatively high ISOs. As you can see from this sequence of portraits shot at all the different ISO settings from 200 to 30,200, you can see that it does get pretty noisy at 3,200, but no more so than most other cameras, and in fact less than quite a few. It's only when you start shooting at night, with long exposure times and large areas of deep shadow, that you really do see the noise. The exposures are, in the main, pretty good. Even in tricky metering situations, such as this picture here, where the white wall was lit by bright sun and yet the camera still managed to produce a pretty good exposure. The auto white balance was perhaps not quite so impressive, especially in artificial light, where it often delivered quite warm pictures and not always consistently the same colour. One of the functions which did impress me was the anti-shake on this camera. As you see by this picture, which was shot at a tenth of a second, handheld from a ship of a moving boat um, with a 50 to 135 millimeter lens. And it's very sharp indeed, especially considering the shutter speed it was taken at. One thing I have to comment on is the design of the menu interface. Some of the abbreviations that they've used uh, are very strange. Look at this one, for example, switch gesture. Um, Apparently that's the, uh, the option to select which focusing point, whether you want 11 focusing points or just a single focusing point, but you really couldn't tell from that. So overall, a mixed bag. On the minor side, you've got pretty poor burst shooting performance, so it's not great for action photography. You've got a menu which verges on the eccentric, and you have to use it rather too often for some photographers to access some of the important features. Also, although it does RAW and JPEG, you can't shoot both at the same time. On the plus side, however, you've got a camera which feels nice, it handles nicely, it's pretty well specified for the price. It's got image stabilisation, anti-dust, and the picture quality is really very good. Another major point in its favour is this use of the uh, K-mount lenses. So if you're a photographer on a budget, say you're a student for example, uh, K-mount lenses are pretty affordable, but also you have access to literally millions of K-mount lenses stretching back 30, 40 years. You can pick these up dirt cheaply. So you can build yourself a pretty good system, not very expensively. We give it 86% because it's a pretty good camera, performs well and is good value for money. Although if you're quick, you might just be able to catch the last remaining K100Ds, which are going for about £100 less at the moment and offer virtually the same specification. <laughs>